Lakefront property is so hard to find out in the desert. What with the giant robots and the explosions. That's right, the Jade Falcon is fighting for some real estate against the Tarians. The Jade Falcon forces consist almost literally of the first four record sheets off my stack with whatever else would fit into a 15,000 point list, while on the other end of the map the Tarians have fit a company and a half into 15,000 points with air support. I have to admit, when my brother showed me the list, I was just a little concerned. That is a lot of stuff to take on in one game, and I... I, you know, I really balked at it, so, you know, you gotta do what you can in these kinds of situations. Just knuckle down, put together a strategy, and see what you can make of it, and most importantly, have fun. Now this important piece of real estate is this building, highlighted right here. We're trying to control it, we've gotta have a unit within two hexes of it, and we have to have it uncontested. If you do, we get a point. If we get to three points, we're just going to call it then. We wanted something just a little bit more complex than just rock'em sock'em robots. As we begin, we can start seeing a strategy form as the Tarians are throwing their heavier assets on the southern end of the river, flanked by some recon units. They throw their drill sins up across the riverbed itself, trying to get up close and personal, and using sprinting rules, we're trying to get those assault mechs up as fast as they can, and the Vixen manages to make its presence very apparent as it throws itself right here, right up next to the building, almost trying to contest it in the first turn. Now they have a lot of air support that they can throw on it, and I'm very, very concerned about the kind of damage that they might be able to do. So I've already plotted out just roughly how long it would take them to get here. It won't be on the first turn, it's probably going to be on this turn. So if he wanted to, he probably could have gotten in here on the first turn, but I just made a very casual bet that he wouldn't. And he didn't. And as we roll into the second turn, we need to be very aware that that air support is going to come crashing in like a hundred refrigerators out of orbit, and we need to do something about it. He spent like almost a thousand points in just, or just, or just munitions, just bombs. So, I mean, we, we can't let that be worthwhile. So we go ahead and we cluster up the assault mechs. We make sure that that Warhawk C is right up and close next to everything so that it can do a lot of damage if he decides to put any of those air support assets against the assault mechs. That just leaves the Vulture here down at the bottom a little exposed as he tries to run around and try to take on the heavier assets for the Tarians. Again, him and the Black Lantern are there just to distract and slow down the Tarians. We want to buy just a few turns, maybe. We're just going to go in there, pop off a few shots, and run away. We have no intention of actually engaging them because he actually outmatches me, and much worse, he's faster than me. So if he chooses to continue the engagement if things go wrong, there's not a whole lot I can do about it. Tari and Locust and other assets begin screaming around the side of the board. He's very aware that I can't do anything about it, so he starts, again, sprinting with the Locust, not intending to actually engage me. He also sends the two warrior helicopters out there to start plinking away at the assault elements from a healthy range. He knows that I'm probably always going to have something more worthwhile to be shooting at with those things, so... You know, he plays his odds very carefully about it. Now we're presented with an interesting dilemma. Do we send the Vixen and Fire Falcon off to deal with the skirmishing elements that are going to flank the assault mechs, or do we send them in to take the objective? Of course, we go for blood, allowing the Vixen to wade into the river and contest the building on his own. The Fire Falcon tries to back him up, but he manages to go into the river, trips, falls, and just manages not to breach his own torso section in the process. Black Lantern goes for blood as he charges forward trying to take on some nice side shots onto the Drillson, but that charge manages to cause enough of a distraction to send the Drillson, who would have otherwise been preoccupied taking on the Vixen and contesting the objective, with heading off and trying to kill the Black Lantern. And as though on cue, the Taurian Air Force rings in through the atmosphere, going to go after the assault mechs. I had very, very wisely tried to predict this maneuver, and the assault mechs are walking this turn. They could have moved just a little bit further, but they decided to bundle up, get close, brace for impact, as the Sabres race through the atmosphere with the Chippewa and the Thunder bringing in quite a bit of pain. I... 
man, this could really, really hurt. But again, this is also, I mean, there's, there's a lot of guns there. There's a lot of guns willing to shoot back, and they have nothing better to shoot at this turn. The Assault Max are going to dedicate all their firepower against those nuisance fighters that are coming at them. Meanwhile, Vulture clears the cliff face, sees the Toro, surprise! Goss round tears the left torso clear off like a poorly hooked fish, guts and entrails blasted across the countryside. Not only rolling snake eyes for the hit location, it also tore the armor off, causing two separate crits, both confirmed for six crits total, with an ammo detonation that probably caused more crits. We didn't bother going through the details of that, that poor thing is emasculated as bits and chunks of them are thrown across the countryside with one solid hit. Chippewa rolls in, unloading its prodigious amount of bombs. The cluster rounds are going to be scattered in a level bombing attack all across the battlefield. He's trying to keep his distance from those otherwise terrifying assault mechs, which would have been very wise had they not been prepared for this or had there not been so many. He decides to drop all of the bombs in the nearby vicinity, hitting almost nothing but managing to hit the Fire Falcon, which he wasn't even aiming at, and thank goodness it's underwater this turn. A little bit of serendipity for him, only one of the cluster rounds manages to connect with him. Overall, the fire mission is ineffective, as it causes, I think, 10 points, if memory serves, to the Night Wolf, who brushes it off. It is a dreadnought. It does not care about such peddly amounts of damage. Lightning rolls in, tries to be more successful where the Chippewa had failed, and manages to splash damage all across the field. Again, a, another high-altitude bombing run splashes damage all over the field. You can see the ripple effect of the explosions just splashing everywhere. We managed to tag the Nightwolf a few more times, causing a PSR and doing a little bit of damage to the assorted mechs nearby. Otherwise, for nearly a thousand BV, the fire mission was ineffectual, having done nothing but dealt about 25 damage to the Night Wolf and a smattering of damage to the other assault mechs. And in return, fire. The fire is absolutely devastating. The Night Wolf and Supernova managed to cause six or seven control rolls on the lightning, causing it to hit the ground. Warhawk C stops, pivots, turns, lights up its targeting computer, and manages to tag two fighters, dealing quite a bit of damage to two sabers, and puts one of them into the dirt behind him. Warhawk C lights up its targeting computer, aims in on the Chippewa, and manages to take it down, dealing salt to the wound of having lost the previous fighter. They also lost the Chippewa in one exchange, leaving the Tarian Air Force with a bunch of little stunt fighters. Nightwolf stubs his toe after all the explosions erupt around him, and he fell down. So much for a dreadnought, right? He gets back up, and he begins moving forward. Now is the time to move in on that objective. We can't allow the Vixen just to kind of lollygag around there by the building, so we're going to move everyone up and forward and let the assault mechs do what assault mechs do, as we allow them to be able to absorb a few turns of fire without having to generate a huge movement mod. But as we move the assault mechs forward across the river and towards the objective, we are leaving the scout elements for the Tarians to do their thing, and they press home on the value of their long-winded maneuver and start hammering home on the backs of those assault mechs. Meanwhile, on the southern end of the board, the prophecy has been foretold as I try to move the vulture back. It's not fast enough to get away from all those locusts the Drillson that decided to come over there, but I can at least try to hide it from the things that I don't have time to kill this turn, like that Devastator and the Warhammer. Moving him so far forward is perhaps a painful maneuver. We'll see if it pays off for the Tarians. Man, I sure hope you like your fighters without ejection seats. This Lyran aerospace fighter is an excellent dropship hunter. Can you guess what it is? That's right, it's the Lucifer! If you're looking to get into aerospace, it's not a bad place to start. The Lucifer is a pretty capable ground strike craft and can manage being an air superiority platform as well. 
And as the duel in the southern end of the map continues, the Hatchet Man leaps into the objective. Now he has to try to fend off three clan assault mechs. We'll see how that works out for him. Meanwhile, the mechs out into the river start getting up and moving away. Again, that is a very slow ordeal for that poor Fire Falcon. Tarian Air Force gets the call to come back and do more damage. This time it's a little bit wiser placed as all three of the Sabres swing in one after another trying to take on that Vulture that is trying to get away despite the Black Lander trying to do a little bit of covering for him. We even sent the Vixen over there, not really because I expected him to be able to really hold off anything worthwhile in terms of force, but because I predicted that the Sabres are probably coming over that way, and that large Pulse Laser might be able to do quite a bit of damage to one of those light fighters. Prudent movement seems to be a little too little too late as the Vulture gets cored out center torso rear as the fighters swing in and deal quite a bit of damage, enough to kill it in one pass. Sabres, amidst a sea of anti-aircraft fire, manages to take quite a bit of damage. Several control rolls later, they manage to be still in decent enough shape to not at least be in forced withdrawal. Meanwhile, effective fire is ringing home by the Tarians. They have ripped the back off of the right rear section of the Supernova and the left rear section of the Nightwolf, giving me something to think about as the Jade Falcons continue their advance on the building. Movement is slowed in this deceptively open terrain as the fainting action by the Vulture has slowed down the Tarian assault elements. They were trying to move slower, assuming that they might have gotten some sort of shot off, but they never did, and the hill has slowed them down considerably. And the clans are dealing with a problem of their own as the river has slowed down everything. The poor Fire Falcon is sloshing through the river as fast as he can, and the poor... Warhawk is also going to move very slowly, but his problems are only mitigated to some degree because he's got heat sinks in those legs, so it's, it's not so bad. The southern end of the board continues to be just a delaying action by the Black Lantern, alternating his mask system in such a way that he can continue to can engage units out there, but also not present himself as a target that can actually be worthwhile. And as his opportunity presents itself, he decides to lunge forward through the opening between the woods and tries to go for the center of the board, dragging several of the locusts with him through that gap. Nightwolf begins moving forward into the woods, harassed by the locusts who must have pilot modifications because those cockpits can't hold cojones of that size as they get danger close up to the Nightwolf, who has nothing better to shoot at this turn. Warriors also begin pestering the Nightwolf at range, very healthy, six hexes away. They can afford to do that, but they can't afford to take the ire of the Supernova, which I just happened to notice that they didn't move very far. So the Supernova, instead of dealing with that pathetic river, trying to cross it, decides to just walk, turn two hexes, and tries to engage the war warriors that are probably going to present the Nightwolf a significant problem, what with its missing left torso or rear. Tarian Sabres finish their maneuvering, scream in through the atmosphere, and decides to go for glory. Having felt the Chutzpah pushing them forward, they decide to single-handedly engage the Warhawk Sea, who is just wading through the river, having, at this point, not a whole lot better to shoot at. But that Warhawk pilot is unfazed. He switches on his targeting computer like Luke wouldn't and decides to pan his weapons against two separate targets, plopping a couple lasers into both of the units, Alpha striking for victory. And he manages to make one of the Saber pilots reconsider his life choices, putting him into force withdrawal after several crits, and the other not giving him the chance to rethink his life as he puts them into the ground, crashing. He gets medals. All the medals. That Warhawk Sea pilot is, well, he's, he's about valued for what he is. He's, he's an expensive unit. And towards the center of the board, we begin doubling down as the Fire Falcon and the Black Lantern try to do everything they can to shove that hatchet man off the objective. Meanwhile, the Tarians have sent the Drillson and a Locust to try to take care of them. Their heavier units are blocked by a couple trees, but they're going to try to take their shots, but they're often hitting on 10s and 11s and missing everything but the sky. Can't say the same for the clan pilots as they open up onto the hatchetman, getting quite a bit of hits all on the left torso, tearing it open and causing three Excel engine hits by stripping out the structure, putting it down. 
It was a glorious charge, and we just got a, just a little lucky. I was not expecting that kind of devastating damage on the Hatchetmen. And in return, the clan units are barely hit at all. We, we get just a few points of damage, but our lighter skirmishers are, for the most part, unfazed. Even the Vixen, highlighted here, spent a little time to chase down a Drillson, having no better purpose for him that turn, opens up with its large pulse laser, connects with the side skirts, rips them open while he's over water, and allows the Drillson to sink with all hands on deck. Meanwhile, the Locust that tries to take on the Night Wolf finds himself on the receiving end of two ATM-9s and is eviscerated in the process. There isn't even enough parts of him to be able to recover. Supernova opens up with five of its ER lasers against those helicopters, connects with one of them, but hits the rotor. That could have been glorious. In fact, in the previous editions of the game, a, a laser would just rip the rotors right off, but instead we just inconvenienced it for a turn. But that's roughly where we called it, as hot knife meets butter, the entire clan force just kind of rolled through the Tarian defenses and didn't really encounter anything other than a minor speed bump that wasn't even caused by them. That river just slowed us down just a little. It was a great game. It was a fantastic game that was largely decided by personal maneuvering, though there was a few good shots coming off. I mean, killing that Toro with that one Goss Slug was pretty epic. Deffler and I talked strategy after the match, and it seemed real apparent that the real lousy move here was sending those bombers after the assault mechs. The moment that I started slowing down, and you can see this in any other opponent, if they start slowing down with their heavy hitters, you should really expect them to give a turn of shooting. And in their perspective, they had nothing else to shoot at, so I was telegraphing that I was expecting them to strike against those assault mechs. And they did, and they all got shot down. I mean, pay no attention to some of the times when I play this game and you have these bombers doing these awesome tricks. Yeah, an assault mech can and will shoot down its weight given the opportunity. But what he should have done, and it would have been easy points, is if he just sent them after the Vulture. The Vulture has almost no capability of defending itself in that position, and it would almost certainly have not shot anything down had it actually connected with something. I mean, it could have gotten lucky, but he would have probably killed the Vulture, and there would be nothing that I could have done about it. Well, this has been an Ouchie's Bat Rep, and thanks for watching. And it really bears emphasizing, bomber loss or not, this entire game was defined by the initiative track being constantly meddled with between Deffler and I. This is something that this editorial format for these bat reps kind of glosses over, but we were constantly baiting each other forward based on our movement in the initiative track, trying to fiend one unit moving one way or another. It's one of the reasons you see their assault mechs did almost nothing the entire game. He's an aggressive little chirper, isn't he? Yeah, it's, it's... I mean, if I can get a crit and somehow you fall over, in the water, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you can cause a PSR with 15 points of damage. I can believe. You can believe all you want. Uh, Look at the old aggressive ice in the tweet about the statistics of the happening.